And so, uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, we're excited to be able to resume seminar over Zoom. And I think this is a pretty convenient format for a lot of us. Um, and so uh, we have Dr. Mike Thurman today. And then next week we have Kelsey Reeves talking about um, modeling variability in surface water quality. And that'll wrap up um, our seminar schedule um, for this semester. And so we're excited to have Mike uh, today talking about um, something kind of, kind of new for him, and I'm sure he'll give some background on this. Um, so, so Dr. Mike Thurman, uh, as many of you know, is co-director of the Laboratory of Environmental Mass Spectrometry here. Um, he's a highly cited environmental chemist and has done a lot of work on analysis of um, different um, organic chemicals and groundwater chemistry. Um, and so now he's, he's moved his, his skills and data analysis to a, a new topic that's, of course, relevant for a lot of us. Um, and so we're excited to, I guess, hear about what he's been doing uh, the past month or so in analyzing uh, COVID-19 stats. So you can take it away and you can start uh, sharing your screen, uh, Mike, if you're... Okay, yeah. let me get share. There we go. And uh, let's see, it's this one. Okay, I think I'm ready to go. Yeah, so th thank you, Anthony. And uh, greetings, everyone, from uh, Ema and my cabin up here in, uh, it's above Jamestown. It's not far from Joe Ryan's house. And Joe will vouch for this. There's well over two feet of snow outside and we're snowed in here. So I'll begin by, uh, giving you a little introduction as to why a geochemist like myself is interested in this topic. And item number one is uh, curiosity. This is a worldwide experiment, the most costly in history, and it's unfolding right in front of us. And how could I not be interested in the data that's just pouring in? And perhaps there's a new way of looking at the data that someone like myself might see some little key to what's happening. The second thing, the second reason is extremely dangerous situation. And the older we are, the more dangerous it is. As you'll see in the data, there's nothing trivial about it. If you're over 60 years old, it's a very dangerous, uh, dangerous place to be. And uh, so I'm wondering, is there anything we can do? Will the data tell us a story? And so today I'm gonna to try to, to do that. And then the third thing is, is the politics. Uh, I've always been interested in, in politics and it's crazy when we have science and politics fighting with each other. I, I see it as sort of truth versus deceit in this case. And uh, I won't go into that in my talk, however. And then why am I giving this talk to our group? And uh, the reason is I'd like to start a dialogue within our research community at CU, especially in the environmental engineering department. And maybe this will be very useful in the weeks and months to come. And so uh, here it goes. I'm assuming everyone can see the screen okay. Yep, yep. Um, right now, the title of the talk is The Past is the Key to the Present, the COVID-19 Stats for Colorado. And you see here in the graph, the front range is 5 million people. That, that live here, that's 87% of the state. And nine counties make up the, the front range. Starting up here in the north, there's Larimer, Weld, Boulder, Adams, Arapaho, Denver, Jefferson, Douglas, and El Paso. So these are the nine counties that I'm focusing my talk on because that's where 87% of the population is and the majority of the cases are there. And so what do I mean by the past? Let's see here. Well, the past to me right now is going to be looking at the data set going back 14 to 21 days to see what's going on and to see if that tells us about the, the present time. And I think I have a small case for that. The second part of the past that I'm interested in is to go back about a hundred years to the, the pandemic of, of 1918. So let's take a look now at the data itself. So where the data comes from, uh, starting uh, on March 18th, which was the last day that Eam and I were in the lab together, we went home and that was it. We haven't been back. Uh, I started, I found this site. It's 
pretty well known by everyone, I guess. It's the COVID-19 Colorado.gov case data. It comes from Colorado Department of uh, Public Health and Environment. And every day at four o'clock, they post the statistics for that day. And so I started doing this maybe three or four weeks ago and it became a passion. At four o'clock, I go to my computer and I check to see what's happened for the day. And I plot all this data in a spreadsheet. So I'm not using any of the plots with one exception, which you'll see in the talk. I'm not using any of the plots that are on the website. I'm making my own. And you can see in this graph, what I did is I took the nine counties here on the left side, and I put in the cases from highest to lowest. So I ranked everything. And then I added some just general data off the web, the population of every county, the uh, square miles, how large each county is. And then from that, you can calculate the cases per square mile by taking cases divided by square miles. You can calculate the pop population density of each county in, uh, in uh, people per square mile. And then of course, the last thing here is cases per thousand people. And so you can see that uh, they're ranked sort of. So what Ema and I tend to do when we're doing large data analysis like with mass spectrometry, is the first thing you do is just kind of take a look at the data. Don't use any of your software tools. Just kind of look and see if there's anything obvious standing out. Well, what you see here is as we rank cases, population generally, goes down. But then there's an exception that pops up right here. And I've blanked out which county that is. You'll see in a minute. So if we go across the cases per square mile, this is a very large county, has a very low count, very low population density, but it's the highest in cases per thousand people. And so what's going on? If we check, it's Weld County. And now where's Weld County is right here. And Ema and I have done a lot of work in Weld County. It is the, one of the hottest hydraulic fracturing areas in the state. There's lots of oil operations up there. There's, uh, there's lots of homes being built here right on the border of Weld and, and Boulder County. There's a big Walmart there. And you'll see why that's important in a, in a bit. And so I checked the just the web to see what the news was. And of course, I've been watching TV and I knew about this JBS meatpacking plant. This is in, in Greeley. 43 employees tested positive for the virus, 14 hospitalized to have died. This was April 14th. They were saying, and this was a, uh, actually a, a television station in, in Hastings, Nebraska that, that I pulled this off of. And they said, well, there were 700 cases. Well, actually on the 14th, the day I did this, there were actually 858 cases posted that day. So this is definitely a hot spot. So that's one of the obvious things that pop up. But let's take a more detailed look now on the next slide and use some simple statistics to take a look at, at this data set. So what I'm doing now is plotting, let me go back, I'm plotting uh, population density versus cases. So population density on the y-axis, uh, cases on the x-axis. And what you see here is um, kind of an interesting little plot. We see Larimer County, we see a, a line, it looks like there's a, a regression line here. There's two major outliers, which I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, so here we are, here's Boulder, Douglas, El Paso County. So we're about the population density is about 500 people per square mile. And the cases is running just below one case per thousand people. Go up to Jefferson and Adams, a little higher, Arapahoe, a little higher. But then over here at Wealth County, we've already talked about it. It's, there's a problem, that's a hot spot. But what about Denver County? And uh, I put it in green because Denver County, <clears throat> if it were following this trend line, should be way over here off the screen somewhere. It should have a much higher count. In fact, it should be closer to about 10 cases per thousand people based on what the rest of the front range is doing. And at 10 cases per thousand, that's New York. 
New York City runs between 10 and 15, depending on which borough you're in, 10 to 15 cases per thousand people. So Denver County has been doing a good job. That's what this means to me. Even though it, it has a rate of two, that's pretty low for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the population density that they have. So that's interesting. And if you look at the slope of this line, then one case per thousand people at a density of about 500 people per square mile. That's our front range average. This number will come out to be very important later when we go to probability theory to estimate what is the danger of going out to the grocery store. So this number will show up again. So kind of keep that one in your head. That's an important, important number. Okay, let's take a look at what I call the cold hotspots. So our governor, Jared Polis, closed down the ski areas, much to our unhappiness, on March 23rd. And uh, why did he do this? Well, we ski at Loveland, and it seemed like everything was fine there. But Vail, on the other hand, let's look at this data. Go over here to Vail. It's in Eagle County. There's 468 cases, and uh, population is barely over 50,000. The cases per thousand is almost like New York City, 8.5. Population density extremely low, 33 people per square mile. And then if you look at Crested Butte, which is in Gugunison County, beautiful ski area, 5.7. Breck, uh, Copper, and uh, Keystone in Summit County, 2.4. Aspen, 2.6. So obviously something's going on. 2% of the population, you look at the bottom of the slide here, represent 9% of the cases. So uh, I, I heard the thing on the news, somebody saying, well, it's probably on the chairlift where, where people are, are getting sick. And I thought, no way. You know where we get sick? You're wearing those heavy ski boots, you're walking up the steps to go to the bar, and what do you think your respiration rate is? It's about two to three times normal. Everybody walks in, we all crowd together and have a beer. It's the perfect place to pass viruses. It's not on the ski runs, that's for sure. So it was a wise choice that he shut those places down when he did, because I think we'll see these cases now slow way up, because these numbers are still pretty small in general. And you'll see N is very important. As the rates become, to, as the rates flatten out, the number of cases play a really important role. And so it's very important to keep those numbers down. And there's your cases per thousand. And you'll see these numbers come back up in a bit. Okay, let's take a look now at the total cases in the state. And so that's this upper graph here. It's actually a power, a power curve that fits the data. And, uh, or excuse me, not a power curve, a, uh, a polynomial. <clears throat> and uh, in places, it was exponential at first, and then it went to power curve. And at, if you look at the last 10 days or so, you can use a linear fit. And that's what we see here on the bottom graph. And what's interesting is the slope of that line is 344. And so we're plotting cases versus days. So what that means is every day, there's 344 new cases on the average, and it's not changing. It's not getting more, and it's not getting less. So that means that um, this, that this is some kind of an equilibrium that's taking place. And we'll, we'll come back to this in a, in a slide or two. So let's take a look now at hospitalizations and de death rates, because they're doing a similar thing on the state level. If we look at the 10-day hospitalizations, we see here that there is about 70 people per day going into the hospital. If the average stay is seven to 10 days, which is what I got off the web, that means you would need 700 beds that are in quarantine for the COVID people. And that 70 uh, beds every 10 days divided by 344 cases, 
or excuse me, uh, 70 cases per day divided by 300 is about a 20% hospitalization rate. So before I look at this number of 200 to 700 respirators, let's take a look at the death rate. And I don't want to dwell on this too much, but basically it's showing about 21 deaths per day, which is 30% of the hospitalized cases. So 30% of this six day curve, and you'll see why I, or, or 10 days, excuse me, uh, hospital stay is at least 200 respirators and probably 400 is probably more like it with a maximum of 700. So you can see why you don't want this curve to go exponential. You want it to stay at, a, at, at the minimum at a one per one rate. And uh, I think that's where we are now. And let's take one more look at the, at the, the death rates because this is important to our our students, faculty, and some of our senior people. This is the only graph that I, I pulled off the website, and it's not quite correct. As, as Zahi pointed out to me in a phone call the other day, there's too many deaths on this plot versus the other. So one set of data isn't quite right. But in truth, in any kind of analysis that we do, of environmental data, there's always error associated with data and error can come from multiple places. But the story here is very clear. If you're over 80 years old, 28% of the people who get the virus die. If you're between 70 and 80, it's 11% and 60, 69, four, and you can see it drops off erratically. So our students, most of them are probably between 20 and 29 years old. The chance of death is quite small. If you're a faculty, the majority of our faculty probably falls in the range of 40 to 60. It's about a 1% chance. But our more senior people, uh, you don't want to be getting the virus. One chance in 10 is, is not a very good odd. So it's important. It's very important. And Dr. Fauci, uh, who is the person leading it at the federal level has said this over and over in his speeches that the young people need to protect the older ones. And this is interesting because if you go to the 1918 pandemic, 100 years back, it was the opposite. All the young people were dying. And I think there could be a ge geographic explanation for that. And I'll talk about that uh, at the end of the talk. But let's move on. Let's move on to infection rates. And uh, this is my own idea that I dreamed up. I'm not an epidemiologist. I, I did study um, medicine for six years before I became a, a geology student. I was in the army. I was trained as a, uh, a physician's assistant. I worked in an emergency room for three years as a civilian. And uh, so I have a little bit of background, but this is my own idea here. And basically, I call it a six-day lag. And what that means is, is that the incubation period, the time it takes to get sick, you pick up the virus, but you have no symptoms. It's rough, It's a long incubation, relatively speaking, for viruses. It's, it's almost a week. So during that time, you are asymptomatic, but you can infect people. And it's very important, I think, to look at that six-day lag. And so what I've plotted here is, the, the COVID cases that have accumulated over six days. And I do this day by day. And what you see here is that sometime in, in uh, let's see, about the 1st of April, we reached this sort of equilibrium, which is where we see the straight line occurring in the plots. And so at about 2,250 cases, uh, every six days. So 350 cases a day times six is this number. And when that rate levels off, we'll call it a flattening and hold steady, we've reached a steady state. So the infection rate, I hypothesize, is 1.0, meaning that for every sick person, they infect one more person. And this has been happening for at least 10 days in a row now. So this is our this is what I call our infection rate. And uh, uh, I like the word tick because in, in the mass spec world, tick has a whole meaning. It's a very important plot. 
So here I call it the total new infected cases. And I've divided it up into three parts. Uh, infect case number one is an infected person who knows they're infected, they're quarantined, and they are affecting others. Particularly, 80% of them are affecting the people that they are quarantined with. In other words, a family member or a friend. And then I2 is a sick person. They don't know they're sick though, they're asymptomatic, but they could affect others because these, th this is a unusual and a dangerous group. And then there's the third possibility, a person who carries the virus, but will never be sick. And uh, we don't know much about this. <clears throat> it's been hypothesized. So what is the tick rate? Well, that's today's new cases divided by the maximum plateau case. And let me show you an example. So the, the tick rate must be one to have the arrow go down or less than one, I'm sorry, should be less than one. So the red arrow in this case is a tick rate of about, let's look at this zone right here at 2000 when the rate, the rate came down for a while. So if we take 2000 and divide it by 2250, the maximum, we're at about 0.89 infection rate, meaning that one person is affecting less than one person in that six day asymptomatic time period. So the six day lag at 350, we've got to get that rate to go down. That's, that's our job. So how can we do that? Let's continue this, this uh, thought experiment with infection rates. So there's our, our, our three possibilities. And le now let's assume some examples. Example one, the infected person has a partner, a family member, and there are 80% of the people are in this case, and they're infecting a family member, very likely. And this example can be stopped by quarantine, which is what is, has been told to do. In the, in fact, the entire family needs to be quarantined, even the people that aren't sick yet, because they could go out and be asymptomatic. So really, they should be receiving food from somewhere. I don't know if this is really happening, but it should be. In example three, I jumped to it next. To find out these cases requires an antibody test to see if they have the antibodies that protect them from the virus. And uh, we think this is small and thought to be slight. And maybe in the future, this might be available. But let's go to number two, because here's where we can have an impact. This is the asymptomatic case. And let's examine this further with Boulder County as our example, because now we're, let, let's check to see what's going on at home. So here's a plot between March 25th and April 14th. And you can see more or less we're following a straight line and the slope of that line is 12 people per day. And so that is 12 cases per day. And we know that in Boulder County, we have approximately one case per thousand residents. And uh, so those are two important numbers. Let's see what happens. Now our incubation period, we're saying is still six days. So that means there's 72 hidden cases in Boulder County at this moment in time. And that's 10 people in the CU Stadium on a fall afternoon or one person in 5,000. So it's the proverbial needle in the haystack. So how do we find these people? If we assume that new cases come mainly from the asymptomatics, what is their infection rate and how do we find them? So here's where we're gonna use some simple probability theory and infection rate to try to get to the answer to this. So let's, let's see what I've hypothesized. Let's calculate the probability that we bump into one of these hidden people. So there's 72 of these people and there's 320,000 people in Boulder County. So that's a pretty low probability. The healthy ones account for a probability of 0.99977. So I'll call this my source one calculation. My source two is, let's go back and say, okay, there's 0.9 cases in a thousand. What's the probability there? It's 0.999, zero, it's actually one, but we'll call it 999. So what is the probability on a trip or some other little store, gas station, that we're, we're gonna bump across one of these hidden people? So the probability of an asymptomatic is the probability that everyone we pass is, is safe minus from one. So that's, that's the probability. 
So let's see what happens when we run it. But before we do, let's take a look at the places we might go. Let's go to King Supers, maybe go to Target or Walmart. Maybe I need to do some repairs, go to Home Depot, go to the pharmacy. And so these are the places that I might go during my quarantine time. So hypothesis one, we meet this one random person in Boulder County that's wandering around with the virus and doesn't know it. So if we pass 10 people, the probability is 1%. And remember, that's the rule that we were told. No more than 10 people gathering. You still have a 1% probability. I mean, in 100 days, you're going to get there, get close. What if we pass 100 people? And it's 10%. 200 people, 20%. It takes 750 people to get a probability of 50%. Now, I know King Supers is busy, but I don't think I've ever gone in with 750 people. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Okay, so what happens? We're not gonna bump into 750 people in any, maybe Walmart could have a couple hundred, but what about the people that work in the store? This is what I call hypothesis two. And this is my takeaway from the probability is that the store workers need to be taking great care not to be infected because 750 people definitely go through King Supers in a day. And this is hand to hand contact. They pick up the groceries, the person handles the groceries, they take their money, maybe pick up stamps, they're less than six feet apart, they're not wearing masks. There's a high probability that the store workers are going to get exposed. And that, that's scary because a 50% probability is a pretty high number given that you're working there every day. Another place to be concerned is the touch screen. Do you think 750 people touch the checkout in a King Supers in a day? I would bet they do. It's probably more than that. You can do a quick calculation, five minutes per person, 12 people an hour, eight hours, Okay, what's that? So, so 100 people at least. That screen needs to be, that screen needs to be cleaned very frequently, I would say. So these are some very dangerous areas. Let's go to hypothesis three. What about health workers? And uh, I show three examples here. The people in the, in the hospital themselves, they're very well covered, uh, but we still hear about cases. What about the ambulance drivers, you know? Are, are they well protected? I've been looking at pictures of people, they're wearing a mask, they have no other covers. And then what about the people taking the tests? Uh, estimates now I, I read on the news are between 11 and 20% of, of health workers. What about the health workers if they go to the grocery store? Many health workers, uh, the ones that are doing the serious work here, like intubation and so forth, they won't even go home. They know they're dangerous. So that's hypothesis three. And uh, the reasons, inadequate personal uh, protection equipment is probably number one. Insufficient training might be another, and fatigue for sure. These are reasons why the health workers are, are probably uh, asymptomatics for sure. What about hypothesis four? And this is travel on airplanes. So, I found this graph. On April 4th, there were almost 5,000 flights in US airspace. <laughs> if you go to Europe and Spain in general, where Ema and I have been keeping an eye, there's maybe a handful of airplanes, not 5,000. So we haven't shut down the air traffic at all. So let's take a look at, at Vail as an example using our probability theory. So a Boeing 737-800 leaves Vail, and what is the probability of COVID COVID-19 asymptomatic person. Well, the random rate in, in, uh, in Eagle County is 8.5. So here's our probability, 200 people on board with crew. The probability theory says there's an 80% chance of someone on board is asymptomatic. I always seem to get a middle seat, which means I've got a person on both sides, one front and back and around. That means I have about a 10% chance of having that person sit right next to me. I don't think I want to fly out of Vail. If we go to Denver, same calculation shows 37% probability. Still pretty high. That's one in three that it might happen. So Eam and I just bought plane tickets. And so we've come up with a strategy of where to sit and how to move on the airplane, but I won't 
to give you that today. And uh, let's move now to the world outside of the Boulder bubble. And that's Mike fl floating around there in the Boulder bubble. So the total cases in the US right now is running a straight line with about 30,000 cases per day added on. So if you do the math, by May 1st, that's a million cases. At a 6% death rate, that's 60,000 people. And uh, using this rate, if we open up the country, there's gonna be 0 0.6, 0 0.6 new cases per thousand of asymptomatics. Pretty high number given the probabilities that we're looking at. What about Europe? A plot of Europe shows a, a, um, a polynomial, which is a good thing to see. When our curve goes polynomial, I'm gonna be a lot happier because that means things are slowing down. So we've not caught up with Europe yet. And when I say Europe, I have five countries here which have exactly the same population as the US. So that's the UK, France, Germany, Spain, and Italy. 320 million people. And right now, their new case rate every six days works out to 0.5 cases per thousand. Spain took, took a hard look at that. Nima and I have family members there, and you can see they're still running about 4,000 cases a day, but it's polynomial, it's coming around. And then the last one I wanna show is Denmark. And uh, I got interested in, in Denmark recently uh, on, a, on a TV article. And it turns out that Denmark has almost the identical population of Colorado. They have 5.2 million, we have 5.8. And uh, they are running 0.2 cases per thousand. When I started this plot, we had exactly the same number of cases in Colorado and Denmark. And you can see Denmark is running about 200 cases per day on a straight line. And that averages out to 0.2. On television last night news, they mentioned that Denmark is uh, discussing, debating whether they're going to open up their schools. And so they're at a, a case rate of 0.2, which would, that would be a probability of 0.9998. So maybe that's a safe rate. I'm not sure. And then finally, as I finish up here, let's take a look at the pandemic of 1918. Um, I'm still okay. It's only half an hour. Yeah. So it turns out it was called the Spanish flu, but it started in Fort Riley, Kansas. So Ema and I watched a, uh, a film here. It was, uh, was a PBS on the pandemic. And if you're interested, you can, you can get it off the web. It's a really nice film to watch about what really happened. And you can see uh, the beds here. And uh, in that film, we learned that uh, the children, when they jumped rope, had a little song they would sing. I had a little bird, its name was Enza. I opened the window and in flew Enza. And uh, if you've ever jumped rope as a kid, you know that that's a nice rhyme. How bad was it? Well, it's, there's some similarities here. It started in January. It started in China in January. Uh, the second wave, there was a huge second wave that occurred in November of the same year. So I think we have to be on very, very much on alert to see if that's going to happen in the U.S. In the U.S., they, I had trouble finding good statistics. There's several books written on this that I would like to get and read. But basically, they were saying about 28% of the population were infected and 105 million out of 105 million people at that time, 650,000 died. That's a death rate of about 0.7%, uh, which is 10 times less than what we're seeing now. So I'm not sure about that. That's, that's a little spooky. Did It stopped. No one's quite sure why it stopped. And um, so that's an unknown. But I did notice something interesting, that mass spacing and the treatment of temperature with aspirin were the only things they had in those days. And you can see that all the police officers here wearing masks, something I haven't seen yet here at home. Not everyone is wearing a mask at this point. And in a hundred years, our treatment of viruses hasn't changed much. We still are doing mass spacing and uh, with aspirin or uh, some other simple drug for temperature. So uh, I'm going to end my 
talk here with, with an idea of a social experiment. And Yuma and I thought we would watch one of the pandemic films, but then in discussing it, we decided to watch The Body Snatchers again. And this was a film that originally came out in 1956. We watched the 1993 model where a EPA water chemist is one of the heroes of the film, although he does get taken up by the body snatchers. And you might say, well, why body snatchers? Well, to me, the asymptomatics are, are body snatchers. And uh, so we start to fear our neighbors and friends. We're all wearing masks and gloves. And uh, here's our g -g governor here with his g -g governor mask. And here's one with the American flag. This looks like someone else, Star Wars. And this one's my favorite. And everybody's about six feet apart. So it's kind of a spooky time. So is there an experiment that we can do? So I'm going to propose an experiment. Why not? You know, and uh, I'm going to say, let's, let's have Boulder County to take the lead to run this experiment. And so here's my idea. It's an experiment to starve out the 72 cases, or let's say 100 cases. And here's how I propose we do it. We close the county for 15 days. And when I say close, no one can come in or out of the county. You cannot leave your home. You can go out in the yard, you can't leave your home. Food had to be stored up for two weeks. No cars on the road, no one goes in or out of the county. The police are the only ones out to block it with, with heavy fines like in Spain, I think it's in the order of thousands of euros if you're caught out if you're not going to the grocery store. In this case, we wouldn't even be going to the grocery store. Hospitals would be open and a few of the, the people needed would be available. What would show up quickly is the number of homeless people in Boulder, in Boulder County. And I would bet there's at least two types. Actually, I think there's three types of homeless people in Boulder. People on the streets, wandering around, sleeping under the bridge, which I see when, when Ema and I take the bus to work, when we did take the bus to work. And then there's the people in their vans driving around that are, quote, homeless, people living in their cars. And then there's the third category that have come from other places and are staying with a friend or maybe a family member. So at the end of 10 days, we would count the cases. And I would hypothesize it's going to be in the range of about 100, maybe less. These positive cases would show up and their family and friends would be quarantined. And during this same time, the next five days would then be our check period to see if, in fact, that number drops very low. And if a strict quarantine would work, if this two-week experiment works, then the state could go county to county, shutting them down and getting rid of these things. And this model would not require a very large amount of tests. The test, I didn't show the graph of that, but there's about 1,650 tests per day, every day being done for the last six weeks. And I don't know why it's always the same amount, but it is. And um, that would be sufficient testing to test the critical people in the county, such as police and medical workers. So those are my ideas. And uh, I wanna end my talk with why I chose the title. As a geologist, uh, I knew and had to study a man by the name of Charles Lyell. He wrote The Principles of Geology, and he published this three volumes in 1830 to 33. And this was pounded into our heads as undergraduates. The present is the key to the past. So I'm going to spin Mr. Lyell around and say, in this case, the past is the key to the present. And thanks, everyone. And I can answer some questions, perhaps. Yeah, so uh, we have we have uh, time for some questions now. Um, if people are have questions now that you can do over the microphone, you can feel free to just um, turn turn on your microphone and ask questions. Or else we also have uh, one or two here in the chat window, and you can also feel free to type your questions into the chat window, and I'll I'll read them off. Does anyone want to start us off? How about Zahi? Yeah, so I, I, I do have a question here. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and I like the exercise that you did with the, uh, with the you know, number of people bumping into each other 
you know, in stores. But uh, the, I, I have a question about the underlying assumption. You know, when a person goes to a store, they can leave mark and can leave, you know, contamination in the stores for extended time. So it's not only the bumping, you know, and uh, how many pe people you pass. Uh, how do you incorporate, you know, the contamination into into such calculations? Yeah, that's a great question. And I hinted at that with the t touch screen, you know, where you you type in your numbers to, to buy your own food. And there is the question about handling the food. Uh, maybe we should all be wearing Google gloves when we go to the grocery store. I, I don't know. Um, that's a tough one. And there's been some data on that as to how long the virus stays alive on a cardboard or metal and so forth. For example, yeah. when you go in the store, if you touch the door or if you touch the handle on the back, the, the cart, you know, those carts get touched by people. And I didn't make an effort to try to guess what that probability might be. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, I, I believe that your number will be, you know, worse. And again, because of the trickiness and the behavior of this, um, of this virus um, and, and the fact that people don't really know what it means to practice, you know, good hygiene uh, rules. So, yeah, that's a good point. And last night on television, the, um, the Pilots Association made a big discussion on the airplanes not being cleaned properly. And so those viruses could be all over the airplane. And so that's another place that I would agree with you, you know, airplanes, haven't been that clean anyway, you know? They don't have time between flights, they just take the, the paper out and that's it, and no one wipes anything down. And apparently there's a fairly high rate among uh, the crew members too. That, that's what I was hearing on the news last night. Yeah, and I think another you know, thing is that's coming up now from talking to, you know, going back to the, our business of water is, you know, how to protect, um, you know, operated, operators in water and wastewater treatment plants. And I think the public, the public shows some concerns now um, about water reclamation plants that do indirect, you know, or non-potable reuse and, and the fear of residuals in, in irrigation water and others. I think, again, that opens a lot of other issues of uh, contamination, cross-contamination and, and, and transfer of- I'm sure uh, in the future, this will be brought up is that mm -hmm. our virus is viable in wastewater, you know, that's probably an idea. So um, Joe, Joe Ryan typed in a question here that I also had um, for you, Mike, um, and that's okay. Uh, a lot of this analysis is done assuming, uh, I guess, the number of cases uh, from people that have tested positive. And so Joe says it seems unreliable, unreliable to keep track of the number of cases because testing isn't widely available. And so I'm curious about that too. How is the pretty severe lack of testing, maybe that lack of testing changes over time. And it, I mean, definitely uh, the number of cases that we see isn't the number of cases that people have. That's a great question, and I have a slide that I slipped in after the talk to address this strange question. And here it is. This is a plot that I did. This is testing over the last 10 days, but it actually goes back much further than this. There's been a constant testing rate, and that makes no sense to me. Why would we have a constant testing rate? and on top of that, the positive rate is always the same, 21%. And this to me suggests that somehow the testing rate is controlling or having an effect on what we're seeing in the numbers about how many positive people are really out there. That the number could be maybe more, maybe a lot more. And, and somehow, I, I don't know what it means, but I know that it's not, it, it doesn't make, it's not logical that there's that only one person in five that's being tested is positive, and it's been like this for weeks on end. Why? It doesn't make sense. So I throw this out there for all of you to think about, to say, what in the world is going on with the testing? You know, how good is the data set? Hi, Mike. Just uh, 
jumping on part of that. Uh, some of it is because there's a screening before the testing. So oh. since it still requires a little bit of the medical, where it was up until about three weeks ago that they had the uh, drive up stations. So there's still a self screening selection that is biasing the data. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Okay, and then uh, Car Carl had a, a question or a comment, um, which relates to some of the other questions we're seeing, but um, it's talking about, he, he said what, what the case rate um, for Colorado would need to be to make it safe for Dead & Co to play at Folsom Field or for really any large gathering events to happen. And so I guess, do you know what you would think to see in the data for to have these events that are have more interactions with people um, happening or, or larger groups gathering? Well, yeah, that would be probably speculation on my part to even guess, but you know, anytime you get to a thousand people, uh, you're going to have that virus being passed around. I, personally, I don't, I would project the future is that we're not going to be able to get together in large groups until there's a vaccine or until herd immunity stops it. That, that's my guess. That would require a lot of infections. <laughs> I know. They say 50 to 70%. Yeah, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, one question from, from Rita. Um, we have students who want to work at homeless shelters, um, on the streets with homeless, or at food banks. I know people that have been doing this well. And there's uh, some controversy around it. I mean, how safe is it to do this type of work? Um, how much does it risk, I guess, increasing the spread as well? Yeah, I think that um, if you're young, the probability of death is low. I mean, there's only two, two chances in a thousand you're going to die if you get the disease. So from a death perspective, I think, yeah, that's, that's I would risk that. I wouldn't risk, in my category, of 11%. That's, that's too risky. Um, the second thing is I would make sure that I had really good personal protection equipment, not just a mask and not just a pair of gloves. That doesn't cut it. you got to have really good protection. If you had that, then I think you could safely do this with some training on how to use that equipment. I would say you could do it. On the other hand, if you do decide to do it, with just a pair of gloves and a mask, you should quarantine yourself. You should not be hanging out with your friends and uh, doing that because you're up in your probability, probably into the 10% range, would be my guess of getting the virus. That makes sense. Um, and then two like comments, questions from Sarah Fisher. Um, just one of them was on a note, which I've also seen a lot of grocery stores are having um, large plastic shields going up uh, to sort of like protect the, the grocery store checkout workers. Yeah. Um, and so she was just making a note of that, but I'm, I'm curious because I actually, I do see like people will just like kind of talk around the shield and so on. So I don't know <laughs> if you think that there are effective measures like, you know, cleaning the touch screen there seems like a good measure, um, but other effective measures that you've maybe thought about um, when, when going to the grocery store or what grocery stores could do. Yeah, boy, that's, I don't think it's a bad idea to have up the plastic shields, but I'm not sure how much protection it gives from the handling of the food back and forth. As Zahi brought up, we have all this touching going on and that's not protected, but it's, it's, I'm sure it's better than not having anything. And if, if you noticed in the PPE, they do wear f face shields to stop the, uh, the uh, the aerosols. So, you know, anything you can do to stop the aerosols is a good, good thing. But you know, um, Mike, we need to also remember, and and I'm an absolutely not microbiologist, but uh, when, you know, when you do some reading, you know, there are tens and you know, or hundreds of thousands of particles in the air. You know, yeah. so it's, you know, and I think that the CDC and the World Health Organization they are not talking about it, but you know, we are breathing thousands or tens of thousands of yeah. microorganisms and viruses uh, you know so bacteria and viruses all the time and you know they are benign body know how to deal with them 
but uh, you know the people that you look at you know in the hospitals they are also wearing this this uh, you know canister with filters that filter their air that go into their masks but you know the ones that are really in close contact um, so so yeah. it's you know it, it can be much more complicated than that yeah that's a good point and uh, there was a comment last week I think Carl made this that uh, the professor in the chemistry department, the aerosol chemist, uh, Jose Jimenez, I, I saw him on TV a couple of weeks ago, and he said that 25 feet was what he recommended. And uh, so I've been following his, his recommendation. So I keep within, I keep at least 20, and I know people probably think I'm nuts, but when I see, I try to keep 25 feet, because <laughs> he's an aerosol guy, and I, I respect that, you know, 25 feet, okay, that, but if someone's jogging, you know, they're putting out an awful lot of viruses if, if they have them. And aerosol, you know, and even, even cycling. I, I, when I do cycle, I wear my mask. It's hard to breathe, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I thought about this when I'm running too. Um, and then the second part of, of Sarah's comment, um, which I thought was interesting, and, and maybe Creston can chime in here too because of, of his biology background, um, but in the Spanish flu, it's been hypothesized that these different phases, you talked about that resurgence in, in November after the initial um, phase, um, these yeah. phases were influenced by the virus itself evolving into more deadly, uh, from to more deadly or less infectious forms. Um, yeah. And so, there's some interesting theories there. Um, and so do you think there's analogs with coronavirus? I, I've heard that it, it, coronavirus tends to mutate less, so it's maybe less of an issue, but um, yeah. Yeah, perhaps Creston could address that. I, I don't know <clears throat> if he's there. Maybe oh, he's sorry. Um, no, I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> for the coronavirus itself, just because uh, this strain is pretty new, they don't know how fast it's mutating. But it's a pretty small molecule uh, overall because its uh, DNA is only 26 kilobases long. There's not much for it to explore in new evolutionary mechanisms. So it probably won't switch around its infectious behavior. So then yeah. you'd say if there was like a resurgence, it would be because of like our behavior rather than virus characteristics? Most likely, yeah. One of the thoughts I've had, and I'll put this question out to the audience, is that uh, why do you suppose that there's such a variety of toxicity among people? For example, um, why is it that some people have relatively mild cases and others go right to the, the viral pneumonia? Is there some way to stop the viral pneumonia? That would be a great benefit if there was some way to stop the viral pneumonia. Any thoughts on that, Creston or anyone else? Again, I, uh, this is Zahi. I'm, again, I, I'm not a microbiologist, but, you know, just I'm, I'm talking to too many of them lately. You know, one of them is John Spear uh, at School of Mines that has uh, a long uh, history also at uh, CU Boulder. But, I, I think, you know, we are throughout our life, we are building our immune system and, uh, you know, some of these microorganisms that we breathe and, uh, and they stick to the lungs, you know, either we, you know, either the body get rid of them somehow, you know, and, and or some, some of them become part of our DNA and part of our, um, you know, of our body. So, you know, some people do it differently and therefore build immunity to also, you know, tough ones like the, this one. Uh, but the, the, that's the beauty of microbiology, I think. Yeah. But also some of it is the interaction that you have with different invading organisms changes as you age, where it starts becoming more of a battle against your own immune response. Uh -huh. So sometimes what they have is these cytokine storms that actually trigger. And then, then that's where you have some of the more organ failure orientations. So we're, we're running up on time now, um, but there's still time for maybe one question. If anybody, there, there, we've gone through the ones in the chat window, but if anybody feels like turning on their mic and has 
uh, some questions, some final thought here. Mike, maybe you should, I saw that you have the slides from CDPAG with their wrong data there that they showed. Yeah. Maybe you can, uh, yeah. you know. I saved this one because it was nice. Azahi called me the other night and uh, it was, we had a, f a fun conversation. And uh, I hadn't really noticed this, but if you go to the plots that uh, uh, CDPHE is doing, they don't fit the data that they've released. And this was one in particular. This is the number of deaths. And it shows it leveling off at 350, and that's not the case. And I don't know how many other plots in there that are wrong. Zahi, maybe you should comment on that. Yeah, I think this one and the one on uh, uh, number of cases. Yeah. Uh, death and cases are, are wrong graphs. I think the one on hospitalization fits nicely the data. And so it, it, looks, to me that it, it looks to me like there's some glitch in the way that they present uh, graphs there, but, uh, but that's, that's not good because people look at it and say, oh, wow, we leveled off, you know, we're good, you know, people not yeah, dying yeah. anymore, yeah, or people yeah. are not, um, you know, not contracting it anymore. Yeah, exactly. In reality, this increase is, is linear though, right? It's, it hasn't yes. exponential, okay, okay. No. And the rate is 21 a day, and it's been that way for quite a while now, at least two weeks. Um, and then one last question um, from Joe Ryan here. Uh, has there been any review of the accuracy of the testing for infections? Initially, there was all the, yeah, there were a bunch of problems with testing um, in the US uh, with, associated with maybe false positives. And so has there been any review on accuracy and so on? I assume maybe the tests now are going through some trials or something like that. I personally don't know much about the testing. Uh, maybe Creston could t tell us how the test is done. A lot of these are qPCR based so that was initially they had an issue with the primer not being very specific but when they had the second version that they uh, have gotten it to be a, a higher accuracy and then uh, some of the newer techniques that are coming out the more rapid tests I haven't seen but I think they've been passing most of the quality checks is it still five days to get a result do you know it depends on the lab that are running it. So like in Colorado, I think it's still a delay at that point because the state itself was licensed to run it. So they didn't have to ship it out to the national labs. Uh, and so it's all run in the, within Colorado. But I still think it's the same test. You know, that, that, this really bothers me because if there's a six day asymptomatic and then another five days on a test, that's 11 days that you're wandering around there asymptomatic or, you know, infecting people if you don't quarantine yourself. Mm -hmm. And I bet you most people, I bet at least half don't quarantine themselves. So actually it's worse than, than what I was showing if that's the case, if it's a five day wait. And, and then we have, we have one last comment from um, Paula uh, Almeida uh, about this, this personal space when doing different activities. Um, Bert Blocken at uh, Technical University of Eindhoven, I think, in the Netherlands, uh, has done a numerical study uh, providing recommendations for different activities. And so it's like uh, five minutes behind when walking, um, 10 minutes behind when running, or 20 minutes behind, or 20, 10 meters behind when running, and 20 meters behind uh, when cycling. So there's an increasing distance you have to go um, for different activities, presumably just because of the speed people are moving at. Yeah, what, what I use is what I call the 30 second rule. <laughs> so depending on your velocity, if you wait for 30 seconds, it probably is pretty close to what he was doing. And uh, don't ask me where I came up with 30 seconds. I guess it's the time I can hold my breath. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I guess there is, this is a good point to stop it. Um, so uh, thanks again, Mike. This was a really good sure. topic and I think there was a lot of really good participation too. Um, thanks everybody for coming and don't forget to come back uh, next week um, for uh, Kelsey Reeves presentation. Uh, and thanks Zahi for Zoom bombing us if he's still around. I think he just... Uh, <laughs> so. Thank you Anthony for, for yeah. hosting too, to Tony. Yeah, yeah. Take care safe. everybody. Stay safe. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>